uh, talking about the peace movement, I think that it is very, very intrinsically linked to democracy, to social justice, to equality, and to human rights. We cannot have any peace movement when we link ourselves to any kind of authority in the world. And this is not, I'm not talking about Pakistan only, it has been expressed by the women's movement in Latin America, in Bosnia, or anywhere. And the latest example is the uh, mothers of soldiers in, uh, in Soviet Union. This organization in, in the, um, the Russia, because this organization was uh, founded, I think, when the, so the Soviet Union was still there, and uh, the mothers, uh, when this whole issue of Chechnya came up, and the young boys were being recruited and being sent to Chechnya. So the mothers, they engaged with the government, and they formed this organization, which was located in the military headquarters, and they said that they were, they were raising the issues, and those mothers who did not have any information about their children, it was sort of a, a place where they could come and get the information and they were organizing trips for them to go to Chechnya and meet their uh, sons and provide some, you know, uh, food and relief items and things like that. But over a period of time, they realized that it is not possible at all for women's group to collaborate with the regime which is so militaristic and which is so authoritarian in uh, nature and they denounced this uh, government in Russia and they said that if women have to fight for their rights, then they have to separate themselves from the structures of the state and the government. Because the nature of the state has not changed. But we have stopped questioning the nature of the state. So I think that we have to learn these lessons from, I mean, it doesn't have, we don't have to wait it happen, it happens to us. We have to learn these lessons from all around the world where it is happening. I'll just uh, read out a few extracts from my paper. In my paper, I looked at women both as primary victims of violence and as potential agents of peace in these existing power structures. I'm not, I'm not assuming that women are the national peacemakers due to uh, their natural capacities and closeness to home but simply advocating that they have more to gain by transforming the power dynamics which makes them naturalize of peace. It is evident from the fact that most local and ardent champions of peace in the world are women's group. They share a sense of powerlessness and a common perspective of making human societies less volatile and more peaceful. And Marion Ashford, she has argued that since uh, women um, are powerless, they are in a better position to form the alliances of powerless people around the world and fight against this whole system of war and weaponry. Because if you look at these conflicts, these conflicts are mainly the uh, such conflicts created by the Western interest powers and the industry of war is benefiting from these conflicts around the world. Uh, and I look at this, uh, it's very interesting to look at this phenomenon of uh, weaponry and the armed forces. And the patriarchal system has ensured the matters of peace and security remain men's domain and has for all practical purposes kept women out of the arena. Armed forces are a mechanism to perpetuate and protect the state power and the most striking characteristic of the militaries which occurred to me is that, that it's so exclusively made. The presence of women in the armed forces is negligible, which comes to less than 2% of the world's regularly military personnel. Politicians and servicemen have always been apprehensive to recruit women that it might change their internal culture. Not only they are allowed in small numbers to avoid change, but also their unsuitability for combat roles is pleaded. Though, man's role, though women's role in military is constantly defined as non-combat, but the distinction is very complex. Mostly women share the same kind of risk in a battlefield. In 1991, in Gulf War, all the American women soldiers who were killed were assigned on combat roles. Some of the arguments put forward in favor of men being suitable for combat roles are very interesting to examine. 
They are based on socially constructed assumptions of main power, man the warrior, the strong, and archaic notion of strength, which is no longer required to use the sophisticated weapons. It is said that to use the sophisticated weapons, what one needs is, is, is skill and stamina. And it has also been said that women have more stamina than men. I am not saying here that it is desirable to take no women into armed forces or it is desirable for women to join the armed forces. But the point which I want to bring home is that the sense women are not suitable for this masculine power structure, they are in a better position to bring peace in this whole time world. Now, the other, other issues which I want to link with the peace movement is the issue of democracy, is the issue of uh, um, equality, equality of sexes, and the issue of social justice. We cannot have, I mean, for me, peace is not only an absence of war. Peace is linked to uh, the society, what kind of a society we have, whether there is social justice in the society, what type of a government we have, and what is the position of women in the decision making. It is true that all over the world, in all the decision making uh, institutions, the presence of women is negligible. Women are called only to create, uh, to uh, clean the mess. Whenever any conflict, take, uh, conflict takes place, then women are called to help the victims and to clear the mess and take up the rehabilitation process. My point is that why they are not called when the power systems as they exist in the world are creating these conflicts in their own interest. They have uh, never been asked whether in such a in this conflict situation the armed intervention should be taken or not. Because simply women are not present in any power structures, whether they are the political parties or in the governments or in at any decision making levels or in the peace negotiations. Some women recently, after this Rwanda Burundi crisis, have forced their way onto the negotiating tables, but they are facing such resistance from men and they are very reluctant to allow women in the peace negotiations. So I think that. Uh, looking at the situation, women, and it's a great responsibility on the women of Pakistan today because as we have seen what has happened in Afghanistan, and we have not really raised this issue of the involvement of uh, the government in uh, the women's affairs, in our personal life, and how the fundamentalism is growing and taking over the society. And I do see it as a um, uh, further masculinization of society where the fundamentalism and the militarization is growing in Pakistan and women are shying away from challenging it. So it becomes our foremost uh, responsibility and need of the time. If the women's movement in Pakistan don't take up this challenge, then I think uh, there will be, I mean, we are already late and we will be too late. That's all I have to say because I'm leaving all my paper out, which is mostly theoretical. And I would just like to talk about an experience of Women's Action Forum in, um, five years ago when Karachi was in the grip of violence. Uh, in Sin, a large number of immigrants who have come to Pakistan in 1947 have, uh, are living in the urban areas. Mostly they have settled in the urban areas in the major cities of uh, uh, Sin. Uh, their politics have been different from the very, very beginning because uh, they always claimed and justified that they are the ones who have made Pakistan and who have migrated to Pakistan, so they need to preserve the ideology of Pakistan. And uh, they have always been raising the issue of the ideology of Pakistan in Kashmir and Quran and so on and so forth and not recognizing the voices raised by the other smaller nationalities of Pakistan. So what happened uh, in the 1980s when there was uh, uh, the nationalist movements in Pakistan, 
in Balochistan and Sin, in Balochistan and Sin in Frontier. Then the settlers who had come to uh, Pakistan from India, from various parts of India, they organized themselves in uh, an organization called Mahajir Kwame Movement. The Mahajir Kwame Movement, which came forward in the 1980s, uh, turned out to be a uh, movement of the Mahajirs for their political rights or for their social rights, whatever it, it was. Now, it, in the 90s, there was a conflict. I, I'm not sure whether I would call it an insurgency, but it was like an insurgent situation in sin when all these militants of Mahajir Kwame movement uh, were fighting the state agencies, whether it was MI or ISI or the Rangers or police, and the military operation took place in 1992. Now, what happened after this military uh, operation in 1992, that the leader of the Mahajir Kwame movement, Altaf said he fled uh, from Karachi and he went to uh, England, where still he lives in, um, uh, in London. And uh, the, the, the Mahajir Kwame movement, after he left, it was, I think there was a split, there were two sections. One section joined hands with the forces of the state, and the other was uh, uh, the uh, section, the, well, the ones who were supporting a thousand, and there was a fight between these two factions of entry. And the state intervened in their fight to, in order to restore, maintain law and order in Karachi, and there were massive claims. There were massive claims from 92 onwards. The militants of both the factions were being killed, the army personnel and the police personnel were being killed, and there were innocent citizens who were being killed because there was sniper firing, and there was firing in the offices, and there was firing in the courts, and everywhere. In the midst of this violence, a small organization like Women's Action Forum, we didn't know what to do and how to respond to the situation. Because we couldn't raise any, there was so much uh, polarization that no, it wasn't possible for us to raise any issue. And all one could find in the newspaper was nothing but the analysis and the numbers, how many people were killed, how many people were missing, how, how many people were fired upon, and there was this analysis thereof. So we got together and we realized that, you know, are the women? There's no voice of them. Are women also fighting? Are also, they have joined the entry of militants? And what about the rest of the women in the city? What are they thinking about this issue of violence and this uh, uh, fight between NQM and the government? And uh, let's get together, let's find out and get hold of some women who could talk and who would like to talk about these issues. It was very difficult in those days because there were pockets. There were pockets which were declared by the government as the no go area. When the police would also uh, wouldn't like to go, or the journalists wouldn't like to go, or anyone wouldn't like to go, because they were the NPM militant pocket areas, and there was those areas in which there was a majority of Mahajirs who were supporting uh, NQN. And people were, like us were very vulnerable who disagreed with the politics of NQN and who were not supporting us. And they were telling us, well, we have nothing against the Sindhis because they are not Mahajis, but those Mahajis who are not with us, they are really traitors, traitors. So it was a very difficult situation. Somehow we got hold of the few common friends of those families in which uh, women have lost their very close relatives. Either they were killed or they were in jails or they were missing. And uh, made contacts those women and it took us a long time to convince them to come to a meeting and talk about their story and what they had been through. Our idea, well, what we thought that this would serve a twofold purpose. A, that we gave a voice to women and we'll know what is happening to women. And secondly, it might bring women of different communities, since there is so much polarization in this uh, city, 
women from the different, uh, different communities, different ethnic communities, uh, Punjabi, Sindhi, Mohajit together and listen to each other and see whether, if at all, any opportunity for dialogue is possible between them. So we organized this meeting in the uh, first of 23rd March 1995, where five women agreed to speak about their uh, about their lives and what has happened in their personal lives and how they have, it has been affected by violence. And out of five women, I think those days only uh, at that time that meeting only three women turned up, right? And we had a, this meeting was kept a secret. The undertaking was given to them that we will not call any press and it will not be publicized. And we called women from different organizations, from NGOs, from uh, news, uh, those who were journalists, and those who were psychiatrists, and those who were interested in the peace issue. So um, about 50 women were invited in that close meeting. And these three women who came to speak about their story, they came from different groups and different communities. One woman was from MQL who had lost a husband uh, who was a militant and she was a young girl of 19 year old and she was put in jail and released after nine months and she had, uh, she gave birth to a child uh, while she was uh, in prison and um, one was uh, that woman from India. There was a teacher, a Sunday teacher, who had lost a young girl um, as a, it was a case of a sniper shooting, who was 18 years old. And there was a wife of a, a police inspector who was killed by an NPO militant. So these three women came together in a meeting and they narrated their tales, harrowing tales, that what happened to their families and how they suffered as women in this whole process. And I think uh, and at the end of it, everybody was crying and there was a dialogue between these three women and they recognized, yes, we have suffered violence from different you know, factions or from different parties, but we have suffered in the same way. So this, uh, these, uh, and uh, we were encouraged to continue such meetings which continued for a period of one year and that process we gathered a lot of women. We didn't have to go and look for them. They were coming from all the communities of Karachi and they were getting together and talking about it and we didn't know what we were going to get out of this process. But we, what we got, got out of this process was at the end of a year we realized that we had a group of 30, 40 women that who are totally dejected by this ethnic politics and want to work with them in that for And we still have this group and a lot of developments have taken place in that process but it has encouraged us as women that perhaps it is much easier and possible for us as women who can empathize to uh, facilitate a dialogue between uh, dialogue among women who come from cross parties or cross borders. We wanted to take this whole phenomenon to uh, to the uh, whole process to sin. And what we did that after this Tango Bahawal incident, we brought the survivors of Tango Bahawal incident from uh, sin and there was a dialogue between these women uh, who had suffered violence in Karachi and those who had suffered violence uh, in Tanjo Bahawal. And um, there was a lot of empathy and they um, came together. But uh, to, uh, for us it was necessary if we wanted to take this process to the interior of sin that some women from a Sindhi organization, Sindhi speaking Sindhi organizations, should come forward and help us in this process. But I'm sorry to say Bani has been talking about the Sindhiani Terry, but I think Sindhiani Terry is not an autonomous movement of women's organization and they have not really affected the base. They claim that they have 15,000 membership or 10,000 or 5,000, but I don't see that they have really empowered 
the uh, women in Sindh, or there is any dialogue possible with the women of Sindhiani, because what they are doing is, is just an extension of Parijo's politics. Yes. So, uh, though, I mean, there are other women from Sindh here, if they are interested, then we can get together, talk about it, and as women's uh, movement, we can take up this issue, take up positions on national questions, and what we are going to do with this uh, millions of Muhammadis who came in 1997 or 47 and not going to go back from here and what should be our position to stand about them. It is possible only when our Sindhi friends join hands and we discuss and develop all these issues. Thank you.